something later. So hit and record. And um, just two past the hour, I'm going to go ahead and dive right on in in just a minute. <clears throat> All right, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome again to the virtual annual users group meeting today. Um, so welcome Vireo users. I'm going to real quick go through some intro to Zoom um, for those of you who have not been using Zoom as much. Um, you'll want to make sure, first of all, that your microphone stays muted. And you may wish to mute your video as well if it's not already. You can mute and unmute your mic and video by clicking on the icons in that bottom left side of your screen. And you may wish to do so for both during the discussion and Q&A periods today. And you're welcome to do that. Presenters will also keep their mics and video muted for the most part until it's their turn to present. If you're curious about who's in attendance today, click on the participants icon in that bottom center of the screen. And if you have a question or a comment at any time, please type it into chat and you can access chat by clicking on that thought bubble at the bottom right of your screen that says chat. So I'm going to just real quick review um, what we're going to be doing in today's meeting. We're going to start the morning with some Vireo 4 updates. We're going to talk about what's new in Vireo 4, get some technical sp perspective on the development and the migration functions from moving to 3 to 4. We're going to get some feedback from our TDL upgrade and migration pilots. We're going to talk about a, the rollout of TDL upgrades to our TDL members and some of the training materials made available to everyone. And we'll have some time for Q&A. So again, when you put some of your uh, questions and comments into chat, we'll catch those during the Q&A. We'll take a 15 minute break before we come back for our Vireo Futures discussion. And um, we will first talk about our short term and longer term development goals and also um, about how you can participate in both development and user feedback. And then we'll talk about the Vireo user group wish list. So um, we're going to ask you throughout the meeting today to please tell us what's on your wish list in chat or in the shared community notes. And we'll get to a discussion about that led by Emily um, towards the end of today. And we'll have a concluding Q&A and discussion after that. And then we'll be finished. We might finish early today, depending on how much y'all want to go into detail and how many questions you have. So welcome, Vireo users, and thank you for joining us today for the first virtual annual meeting of the Vireo users group. Usually we do this at TCDL in person. But an advantage of going virtual is so many more of you are able to, to attend today. So first, I'd like to share a little information and resources to help you stay engaged with the meeting. Um, we've also dropped the links into these agenda and our community shared notes document in the Zoom chat for you. But in particular, I'd like to ask that if you're planning on taking notes today, if you're willing, do so in the shared notes document. Um, in the spirit of sharing and community, and then we'll share those out with you afterwards. And again, if you missed the link, it's also provided in the agenda for today above the, the table in the wiki. Throughout today's meeting, also please again use the Zoom chat to list your questions as you think of them and we'll address them during the Q&A we've set aside. Also use the chat throughout the meeting to add your Vireo wishlist items and we'll capture them to talk about during the meeting's conclusion. So 
We're going to find out who's joining us today and who's hosting. So let's first find out who's with us today from the user community. Um, please go ahead and drop your name and institution into the chat box so we can get an idea of who's represented. Um, we'll also run a few polls in a few minutes to get a to get to know who's in this crowd and what you do with Vireo. While you're adding your introductions into the chat, I'll go ahead and introduce our host today from both the Texas Digital Library and the Vireo Users Group Steering Committee. So feel free to jump into chat. I see lots of you are. Thank you so much for introducing yourselves and again, welcome. So as many of you no, Vireo is developed and maintained by the Texas Digital Library, or TDL, in collaboration with contributors from Texas A&M University Libraries, the LCAC Library at Texas State University Libraries, along with other contributors from within the TDL and Vireo open source communities and Texas Tech. TDL supports 14 of our members using our Vireo hosted service, and many of you are here with us today. So again, welcome. So I'm going to ask our TDL representatives to give a little wave when I mention your name. Um, first, we have Christy Park, who is TDL's executive director with us today. Thanks, Christy. Frank Smutniak is joining us, and he's TDL's lead Vireo developer. You'll hear lots more from him today as well. And I am Courtney Muma. I am TDL's Deputy Director. Our other hosts today, um, last but absolutely far from least, are the Vireo Steering Committee, um, which organizes all of the Vireo user group activities, including this annual meeting. It also solicits ideas from the users group about how to improve Vireo, and then it documents those ideas and organizes them on your behalf. The steering committee consists of two co-chairs, one from a TDL member institution and one from outside of the TDL consortium. One co-chair joining us today from TDL's member institution, Baylor University, is Billy Peterson Lugo. Billy, please say hello and tell us what you do at Baylor. Um, hello, good, good morning. I think it's still morning. So um, I am Assistant Vice President for Digital Library Services and Systems. Thank you, Billy. The other co-chair joining us today from outside of the TDL consortium is Emily Wuchner. Emily, please say hello and tell us what you do at the University of Illinois. Hi, I'm Emily Wuchner. I am the Associate Director of Student Experience at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and part of my duties is overseeing the operations of the thesis office. Thank you so much, Emily. So the steering committee also has a product owner who serves as the liaison between the Vireo user group and the development team. They receive the prioritized list of software improvements from the steering committee and then they negotiate their adoption by the developers. The product owner also has the final say on whether or not the system functionality sufficiently addresses all of the requested needs. The current and brand new Vireo product owner is Chris Starcher from Texas Tech. Chris, please see, say hello to everybody and tell us what you do at Texas Tech. Hello, um, I am the digital uh, systems librarian at uh, Texas Tech University and I uh, uh, do systems administration and software development there and uh, have been doing um, uh, part of the users group. Um, and I've also been uh, involved in development with Vireo as well. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, Frank and I also serve as part of the steering committee on behalf of TDL. And now I'd like to hand over to Christy Park, TDL's executive director, to say a few words about our outgoing product owner. Thanks, Courtney, and hi, everybody. Thank you all for joining us um, today for this meeting. I'm excited to see so many folks here. We are, Texas Digital Library is really proud to be the home of the Vireo open source community. I'm really grateful for all of you, everybody um, attending today for your engagement, for your use of Vireo, for the contributions you make, um, to our members who are financially supporting area development through your membership in TDL, but also to all of you 
not in TDL, in the open source community who are here with us today, who are supporting through, um, you know, your feedback, your engagement, and your uh, code contributions to this effort. And I want to say special thanks to one of our members, Texas A&M, who've, who've contributed a, a number of development hours, a large number of development hours to the, to the effort as well. But I also want to take a moment here as we get started to thank Stephanie Larison, who um, recognized her. She has been a solid foundation on which so much of Vireo 4, but going back before Vireo 4, um, has been built. Going back almost a decade. Um, so, Stephanie is the Electronic Resources Librarian at Texas State. She's also the outgoing co-chair and product owner for uh, the Vireo Steering Committee. And she has been the co-chair of the Vireo User Group Steering Committee since 2011. So, nearly a decade of service to this community as its co-chair. She was initially, she, she shared that view with Laura Hammonds at Texas A&M and then with David Reynolds at Johns Hopkins University, and now with Billy Peterson Lugo at Baylor. She's also, she's been the product owner for all of your board development, which has been an ambitious and lengthy uh, bit of service. But she was also a product owner for Vireo 3 development as well. So everything you love about Vireo 3 and Vireo 4 is a result of Stephanie's leadership. So her steadiness and commitment to Vireo and its community have really just been extraordinary. And we couldn't have reached a single milestone with Vireo development over the last nine years without her leadership. So we all owe her a debt of gratitude, especially TDL. Um, she has earned a break from uh, leadership duties on the Vireo steering committee. And she's also earned our gratitude um, really uh, all of us and I know that you'll all join me in chat through email in whatever way you can to show your gratitude to Stephanie for everything she's done to make Vireo 4 a reality. Thank you Stephanie. So um, with that I think we're going to move into uh, a few poll questions and I think uh, Courtney is launching a series of polls here. Um, and I don't think I can advance the slides, so uh, you may have to advance the slides for me as well. But our first question is whether you're from an institution in Texas. All of these polls should be available to you um, at once. How do you interact with Vireo professionally? as a faculty member, a library worker, a worker in the graduate school, administrator, developer, or systems administrator. And third, how long have you been a Vireo user? Are you new to it? Are you an advanced user? <laughs> and it's possible that you've never used it, so we want to know that too. We'll let this run for just another few seconds so that everybody can participate. I think maybe we've got everybody now. Just about. <clears throat> We're right about there. Yeah, I think so. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end it. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'm going to share the results. <clears throat> So it looks like uh, about, well, exactly two thirds of you are from a Texas institution, but that means we have a very healthy representation. Uh, one third of participants today coming from outside of Texas, which is really wonderful. We're glad to have you here. And um, those folks not in Texas or not part of TDL who are using Vireo or interested in Vireo, we need and want your participation. Um, in the future of Vireo development. So we're very grateful to have you here today. Um, in terms of how folks are interacting 
with Vireo professionally, most, a majority, 66% are coming from the library. But we have six folks, or 19% uh, from the graduate school, and 16% who are 16% uh, plus 9%, <laughs> so about 25% who are working with Vireo in a tech from a technology angle, either a systems administrator or developer. And one person who's a faculty member, which is great. It's great to have that perspective as well. I have one person who says other, and I'd be interested to know if you're willing to share um, in the chat what that other is. And then finally, how long have you been a Vireo user? Uh, we have a few, it looks like a handful of folks who've never used Vireo but are interested. Welcome, that's great. 44% um, in that one to three year category. So a lot of new users, which is great. And then uh, looks like a majority of folks who have used it four years or more. One person since 2009 uh, has been around since 2009 with Furio. And I'm wondering if that's, well, I don't know. It's probably not Stephanie. It might be Stephanie. But that's great. We have somebody here who's been here since the very beginning. Well, thank you for your participation in this poll. It's really interesting. I'm now going to hand it over to Billy Peterson Lugo, uh, one of our steering committee members, to talk a little bit about what's new in Vireo 4. Okay, I'm going to assume that everybody can hear me. I'm going to bring up my slides. Yes, and I'll tell you when I see your slides, Billy. Oops. You should see my slides, is that correct? Excellent, thank you. Always good when technology works <laughs> on the first go around. Um, well, thank you everybody for attending today. And also many thanks to Stephanie Larison for this presentation because she gave me these slides. I made some modifications, but my modifications were very minor. This is primarily her slide deck and me just giving my perspective. Um, so going forward with that, what I'm really going to focus on today are what I view as the changes in Vireo 4 from Vireo 3. And there are actually some pretty significant changes, especially the very first one, or the first two that are listed there. Um, and I will go into detail, a little bit more detail about each of those, but not not like digging down into the weeds kind of detail. The most significant change has been with this concept of organizations and categories and the bulk of this presentation may actually focus on this because of um, this was a significant catalyst that resulted in the difference, the main difference between Vireo 3 and Vireo 4. Up until now, only one submission workflow could be established in Vireo. Historically, that one workflow was established for the graduate school and library personnel to effectively manage the submission of electronic theses and dissertations. So even if a graduate school handled dissertations differently than master's theses, they still had to go through that same workflow. They still had to use that same submission form. It was, it was all identical. So with Vireo 4, institutions can continue to work that way. If you just need a single workflow, that's what works for you. You don't want anything more than that, then that's great. You can continue to use Vireo 4 in that way. However, for those with the need, you can set up multiple workflows within Vireo at this time, once you've implemented Vireo 4. Um, this is done by creating organizations and organizations are a workflow and a workflow is basically the submission form. At the very top level, you have the institution. This is presets. So at, in, my, in my case, the institution would be Baylor University. And at the institution level, you never accept submissions. It is simply, you, you may make some edits initially, but um, once you've done those initial edits, you don't make any changes. 
These next few slides provide a preview of the setup associated with the institution. Um, the same setup also exists for each sub-organization or sub-entity that you create. So this is sort of, this will be a familiar look and feel, these three tabs, application, workflow management, and organization. At this point, we're looking at the organization for the institution, and we're going to um, manage the workflow. And one of the things to recognize about managing the workflow is that you can set default settings at this level. And so these default settings will carry down through all of the other entities that you create. So you want to think about this carefully because there may be some things that you don't want to carry all the way through. You absolutely know you're never going to use those any place at all, and so you eliminate them from this very top-level workflow. But there may be ones that you absolutely want carried through. You want an author. You want a title of the work, for example. So there's some thought that needs to go into what you're going to set up at the default level, um, at the top level. And another way of looking at this is that the institution is the parent, and then below the parent, you get children, but even the children can be parents because there may be um, children under those. So it's a very hierarchical structure. Once again, as I said previously, the organization never accepts, or the not the organization, the institution never accepts submissions. So that all, should always be set to no. Vireo 4 enables the creation of new organizations and note whatever is created here will be added to the institution, which means it will be hierarchically at a level below the institution. And creating a new organization is akin to creating a new workflow or a new submission form that is tailored to that particular entity. These are default labels for those organizations. So you can have colleges, you can have degrees, departments, programs, majors, um, and administrative group system settings. But you can also add, if, there, if what you need to do isn't appropriately um, identified within these particular labels, you can also add a label that better fits your needs. So the question is, looking at your institution, what's going to work for you? And next I'll provide some examples of ways that you can think about this. So in this case, so you can tell this is from um, Stephanie's slides because Texas State is the institution. And in their case, what they've established is they have two, they don't have anybody else, at least in this representation, they're the only, they're only the theses and dissertations are being submitted to Vireo, but dissertations and master's theses may actually have different workflows. And so under Texas State, they have set dissertations and master's theses as two separate workflows, two separate organizations that are under that parent organization. And whatever the default settings are at the Texas State University level, currently those are carried through to that next level. This is just an example of what that looks like. You just create your organization and you give it a name and then you add it to the institution. Um, this is another example where there may actually be a college that also at Texas State perhaps, and that college has a slightly different way of doing submissions and maybe they only do master's theses and they don't have dissertations at all. So a college of health has been added to the institution and then within that college a degree has been added for masters and in each of these areas a decision can be made whether submissions are going to be accepted. My guess is the, the um, Submissions are only accepted at the master's level. From a user's perspective, when the student goes and logs into Vireo to start his or her submission, 
they're going to see a screen that looks something like this and they're going to be asked to choose the college that's appropriate for them so hopefully they choose the appropriate one let's say in this case arts and sciences and notice also it tells you that arts and sciences has two options available to it and that the college of health only has one and then at the next point and this is a additional slide that shows you the flow of what's happening here so college of arts and sciences has doctoral and master's thesis college of health professions has just master's thesis so you choose doctoral level college of arts and sciences two options now i'm going to choose the doctoral level and now it's saying now i'm ready to start my doctoral submission and i will be using the workflow that is specific for that particular submission one of the things about vireo 4 is that all of these entities that submit to vireo 4 everybody we'll see everybody else's submissions, which you might be saying, that's a lot of stuff to wade through. In reality, you can set up a filter. So in this case, they've set up a filter that says, I'm only interested in seeing the submissions for College of Arts and Sciences. And so those are the only submissions that you'll see. So you don't have to wade through everybody else's submissions. You can just focus, you can just filter by the submissions that are appropriate for your use. So creating an organization, setting up these workflows, the submission forms, um, the endless, the, the options are endless, as this slide says. You do need to plan carefully. And I can provide another um, scenario, something that Baylor University is looking at. Ideally, what we would like to do is to create colleges for arts and sciences, the graduate school, the honors college, and Truett Seminary. So we would have four colleges. And then within arts and sciences, we want to create a department for museum studies because there are non thesis based works that also fulfill the degree in that um, department and they um, currently don't go through the graduate school, but now now we can we can push them through Vireo. Additionally, um, the graduate school will continue with its current submission workflow. We don't anticipate any changes in that, but undergraduate honors theses will be submitted to the honors college and works for completing the mdiv degree will be submitted to truett seminary and as we work through these different scenarios we'll need to think about um, and plan how this is all going to play out even though initially we will focus on getting the graduate school up and running um, not too far into the future we'll look at adding these other entities into vireo so that they can also submit this way so the other piece of this is customizing the workflows and this is actually this is the part that really is makes it unique for that particular entity that they can set up the workflows exactly in a way or the submission form in a way that works best for them um, the default settings sit at the institution level and you'll know don't delete anything because you don't you don't want to lose those things because somebody may actually need to use it further on down the road um, you probably don't want to make changes after things have already been set in place and people have started using things so you need to map things out and be sure where you're at before people start submitting um, repeating again never accept submissions at the institution level so here we have a university submissions are not allowed at the university level we have a degree level of graduate um, here we've got the university the, um, the graduate school submissions are not allowed at the graduate school level so when you get down to the submission type of dissertation or master's thesis now submissions are allowed let's say in the graduate program you don't need that program option in the workflow so you want to remove it and that applies to both dissertations and master's thesis workflow so it came down from the university graduate school doesn't need it or the graduate degree doesn't need it so they remove it that removal carries through to the next level down the dissertations and the master's thesis 
and there's an example, it's been removed from the graduate workflow. Now let's say further, and here you can see it's been removed from both of those, but additionally, master's theses don't need um, to send their theses to ProQuest. So that's going to be removed from the master's thesis workflow. So now you see there's a slight difference between what happens in dissertations and what happens in the master's thesis. Moving along, let's say we add in an undergraduate program. And in the undergraduate program, we've established the honors thesis submission type. And you'll notice that whatever the default is in the university level, it's been carried through to the, to the undergraduate degree level, which has also been carried through to the honors thesis. So here you see multiple workflows have been set up for dissertations and master's theses that are going through the graduate program or the graduate degree. And you see honors thesis, basically no changes from the top level going through the undergraduate degree. Um, this more or less completes a, a very quick overview of how the multiple workflows can be established in Vario 4. The next set of stages, although important, are not as complex as this particular change, and so they're a little less time spent on them. It's more of a um, sort of a show and tell of what's available that is not currently av available in, in version 3. And starting with the enhanced um, field control for filtering, flagging, and tracking. Within the workflow, Vireo 4 provides more options for filtering, flagging, and tracking. This is a sample with every field. You will see a screen that looks like this. Some of these are familiar if you use Vireo 3, the idea of something being required, something being disabled. Those are familiar concepts, but there are some things here that are new. Um, the ability to flag something, the ability to log any field that you want. By logging means what if someone does something with that particular field then that change is captured in the log. Um, I'll start with the flag field. Basically a flag field, basically a flag field um, allows you to establish a filter that will display all the time. So in this case, they're flagging the institutional ID, and that means it will always appear as a filter that can be used. Um, and this is an example of a log field. In this particular case, they're saying, yes, I would like to have this log. So every time somebody makes a change in the first name, this might not be a field that you really want to log, but if you did, um, it would be recorded in the log every time that the field was changed and who made that change. This is um, filtering and sorting, and this can be done on any field. So this is more closely tied to your Vireo login. If there's certain things that you always want to display over in the filter area on Vireo, then you can move them back and forth between the displayed columns and the disabled columns, and you can also order how they display so that when you log into Vireo, then you will see those items available for you to use as filters. So the difference between this and flagged is flagged will always display for everybody. Um, this is more of a choice of what you would like to display for yourself. Moving on to metadata. Um, the metadata in Vireo is based on the most current version of the Texas Digital Library Descriptive Metadata Guidelines for electronic theses and dissertations. Note, you do not want to edit the metadata key. So that needs to, that needs to remain as it displays. You can um, alter or um, revise information that displays under the help. 
you can also change the label. So if you don't want the label to be major, but you want it to say major field of study or specialization, whatever you want that label to be, you can change that. But, but it will always be associated with that specific metadata key. And somewhat related to metadata is control vocabularies. Um, Vireo 4 makes use of control vocabularies across all, all, almost all the fields. And this is um, where you can find the control vocabulary management. And you can select any one of those, uh, particularly the ones that have the little people icon, the ones with the globe icon, that's addressed in a slightly different area. Um, you can also create new controlled vocabulary. And you have the ability to, you could start with the controlled vocabulary that's provided. And you, if there is some provided, you could export it. You could modify that CSV file and then you could upload it. Or if you're starting from scratch, you can create your CSV file that contains that controlled co vocabulary and then upload it. Um, associating it with the particular field that that controlled vocabulary is associated with, connected to. And so that is a very quick overview of the changes in Vireo 4. Um, I'm not sure if we want to do questions now or a little bit later, but Nothing. feel free. Go ahead. Nothing has come up so far um, in the chat in terms of questions, but there was one um, comment. Um, Rutger, would you like to um, unmute yourself and add your comment to the conversation? Yes, well, what we have noticed, um, we also had it set up like a department and degree level underneath it. Um, so we had a department for um, social sciences and one for science, for example. And both had a container under it named Bachelor. And what we wanted to do is was send an email to, to one of the, um, yeah, to, to the people that are connected to the container in the, with the email address. Uh, however, if you try to do this, you have to check the, for the email connected to this organization, which is called Bachelor. But there are two named bachelor and you can't <laughs> distinguish between them so i would really warn you not to do this <laughs> that is note to self that is very excellent record that is a good recommendation <laughs> thank you that's really good feedback thank you I'll it add also that. does not matter if you have two of them and you select the first or the second it does not matter because it simply checks for the text uh connected to the the roll out menu menu and not to the uh, placement in the list or anything else. So, so really be careful with that. Careful how you name things. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. And I'll add that to the notes. Um, so Billy, thank you so much. Um, we don't have any other questions right now, but again, y'all, if you do have more questions as we move along, keep adding them to the chat and we'll have some more time set aside at the end of this morning session to um, address all the questions. Um, One other thing I would say is that um, on the screen that's displaying right now is a bit.ly link to the Vireo user documentation. So um, you can go there to get more additional information. Thank you so much, Billy. And that link is also in um, this, the agenda and the slides as well. Um, and before we jump into our next section, I just want to um, correct a mistake that I made, um, a grievous oversight, in fact, in introducing our newest steering committee member. Um, so I'm going to beg his forgiveness and introduce him right now. And John, I'm going to ask you to say a little something about what you do at UT Southwestern Medical. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's, that's, all, that's all right. Um, so I'm John Crossno. I'm cataloging and metadata librarian at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. And I'm the Vireo administrator for our campus. So. And you're just diving right in, steering committee and pilot this year. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> 
Um, so next up, uh, folks, and thank you for that, John. Um, we're going to have Frank Smutniak, the TDL lead developer, and Chris Starcher from Texas Tech, our product owner, um, talk a little bit about development and migration as it's been going for the last couple of years um, and some of the newer developments as well. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, Frank, and let you share your screen. I'll let you know when I can see it. I should be live. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, so just I, I want to uh, go over just a little bit of background. There, Vario three uh, was written in Java Play, and there's also uh, you know, it, uh, and when Vario four was created, it was a completely. Oh, let me change the presentation mode. That might be a little better. There we go. Okay, so uh, it, Java, uh, Vario 4 was a complete rewrite from uh, Java Play to Java Spring Boot and started several years ago. Uh, Texas A&M and Texas Tech and others uh, did the, the major lifting of, of bringing this uh, uh, product about. Uh, and you know, I just came on uh, about two years ago, uh, so I, I've been ramping up as well. Um, and of course, a lot of work has been done in the last uh, couple of years with uh, updates and bug fixes. Uh, one of the things, though, also uh, we we host fourteen uh, some sites at TDL, and then there's also other people that host their own sites. Uh, so there's also, uh, we need a way to do migrations. There's uh, the, the schemas for the, very, the schema for Vario 3 and schema for Vario 4 are quite different. Uh, so some work needs to be done there. So there's, there's a lot that needed to be done bringing Vario 3 to Vario 4. And again, a, a lot of work has been done by various people and institutions over the past few years. So uh, let's see. Uh, so there's, you know, recent fixes, there's been, uh, a f you know, if you go on GitHub, you'll see uh, the long history of uh, issues and, and there's been, you know, uh, fixes. Uh, there's probably a hundred some uh, current issues that they're minor, they're, they're not showstoppers. The ones we focused on in, in recent times are things that we felt uh, prior to migration to, to once we do the migration, having something that was, you know, had, had high functionality and didn't present major problems to, to users. Uh, there will be more bug fixes, there will be more bugs found. Um, that's part of the nature of software, but uh, we're, we're at a point where we think it's, it's very usable for the post-migration. So some of these things were uh, related to email generation, uh, sending out batch messages. Uh, to um, you know the submitter, the advisor, etc. There are some user interface problems where if you went, if you tried to uh, pick a graduation date, set a graduation date, if you uh, chose a year, you you um, had problems getting back to uh, the month selection. So little things like that that were were problematic. We made sure we we wanted to create a better user experience. Uh, also, you want to be able to specify the the custom actions and embargoes. How uh, you know what and have students handle those in order or fulfill those in order. Um, data export. You you have to be able to export your data to various um, um, locations and different file formats. Th those those are very much uh, a quality of uh, use issue. Uh, also, you know, software, the dependencies, there's, you know, many dependencies that uh, Spring Boot and, uh, and this product depend on. And we try, we got to keep those up to date because, you know, you find uh, security flaws or uh, things are just broke and, and they fix and, you know, the, these open source projects get fixed as well and we want to make use of those fixes. Uh, Shibboleth documentation, that's something that's in progress. Uh, Shibboleth, uh, one of the things is, uh, a change in, uh, for example, all of our hosted sites are on Amazon, and we've undergone the upgrade from Amazon Linux to Amazon Linux 2. Well, that necessitates a change in the Apache you use, and that necessitates a change in the uh, 
service provider or shibboleth client that you use. So we're, we're actually going through that process right now and uh, we'll have that documented after we uh, do some of our own uh, fleshing out. So, and see, um, there have been uh, three migration pilots starting in the fall, last fall and University of Texas Southwest Medical Center, University of Houston, Texas Tech University. What we did is we established a migration uh, server for them at, using Vireo 4 with the, the current version of Vireo 4, or at that time. And we did a, a single migration from their Vireo 3 to their Vireo 4. And so they got to experiment with Vireo 4 using their real uh, data that they know in Vireo 4. Um, and so these three institutions uh, stepped up and uh, they did a great job of um, uh, being uh, willing, willing test cases and uh, giving feedback, giving very useful feedback. And you'll hear more from them in a little bit. So, and see. Uh, so, uh, like I said, we needed to migrate from Vireo 3 data to Vireo 4. There's uh, schema changes. Um, and uh, the software is, is written all in Ruby, uh, which is a convenient uh, way to do it. And it only looks at the um, Postgres database for a populated Postgres database for Vireo 4, sorry, for Vireo 3. And it will copy data into a Vireo 4 base database. By base database, I mean it's populated with the control vocabularies, it's already got the tables there, the schemas are all set, but it's, it's empty of actual uh, user data. So uh, running these uh, migration programs will uh, copy uh, the, the Vireo 3 data and do whatever changes it needs to do to formulate it according to the Vireo 4 schema. And uh, one thing that uh, most recent change to that software has been being able to handle incremental changes. So when you do a wholesale migration from Vireo 3 to Vireo 4, that's great. But if you have Vireo 3, uh, people still using Vireo 3 in the meantime during an interim period, and maybe there's uh, people using Vireo 4 uh, at the same time, you want to be able to take those changes just from Vireo 3 that have happened since the last migration, copy them over to Vireo 4, and not run over any new Vireo 4 data. So uh, that's that's been a recent change. Um, so, and this is available on GitHub, uh, publicly available for non-TDL hosted um, servers. People can uh, go ahead and use this code. Uh, there's some documentation there, um, uh, hopefully through users' questions and uh, uh, a lot of back and forth, I can refine that document. And uh, you know, I, there's probably things uh, that uh, may be unclear and I wanna uh, refine that as we go. So that'll be in the works. And so uh, this summer, we will have uh, the 14 institutions um, that will be migrated and we will establish a, for example, there's uh, Sam Houston State University, they, they're going first. Um, we have SHSU-ETD. Well, we also establish a server SHSU-migrate-ETD and that format will happen for all, all the institutions. So that will be their Vireo 4 server with their Vireo 3 data on it. They can use them both simultaneously. And there are some rules to make migration possible. There, there will be some rules set up uh, about what you can change. You should be able to change anything in Vireo 3. Uh, changes in Vireo 4, we, we'll have to set some guidelines so that that data transfer happens cleanly. But anyway, over the next four months, we will be uh, migrating 14 just different institutions with lessons learned along the way. Um, so as I mentioned, there'll be simultaneous availability of both of them. And eventually once uh, everyone's comfortable with uh, how the migrations are and how Vireo 4 is working, then uh, Vireo 3 will be uh, do one last migration over to Vireo 4. And that will be all the changes and we will change the domain name and, and remove that dash migrate from the middle of the domain name and that will be their their um, active uh, Vireo 4 server. So, 
that is uh, in a nutshell what uh, we've done and what what kind of changes uh, have been done and uh, the migration process and come September uh, hopefully we will all be or not September but sometime in the fall we will all be uh, have all of our uh, servers migrated and everyone will be using 304. That's it. Thank you. Thanks for that, Frank. Um, I don't see any questions yet uh, in the in the chat. Um, let's see. There's a comment right now, Frank, from Rutger about the test server not yet functioning correct correctly. And I don't know what uh, Ricker, what do you mean by the test server? Do you mean the sandbox? Indeed, the sandbox. Uh, the sandbox. Uh, I will frequently update that, and sometimes that uh, wipes out old data. Uh, so it's really meant to be, you know, uh, you go in there, you try something, uh, there, there shouldn't be any per persistent data. Uh, if you want to, in the chat, send me a specific message about what's not working, I can take a look and I, I frequently will update it. So, or if you want, to, if, is there a specific thing that is that is not doing? Oh, Tiny MC. You know what? That my uh, that I think was recently updated on uh, one of the the active branch, and uh, that should be fixed in the the next version or the next update. I did. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Rutger. Thank you. Um. Alrighty, we're going to move on just to stay on time this morning. And again, we'll have more time at the end of this. So if you think of other questions or comments, go ahead and add them. Um, but now we get to hear from our excellent TDL member pilots for Vireo 4. So Frank mentioned them already a little bit. But um, I'm going to introduce John Crosno again um, from UTSW Med, um, Shelly Barbara from TTU, and Taylor Davis Van Atta from University of Houston. And I'll stop sharing so y'all can share, John. All right. Sharing? Yes, I can see it. Thank you. All right. So as mentioned, the, you know, the, 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 the three institutions, we did our pilots. And we, we thought we would just provide some brief brief introductions to our institutional environments, what, how, we, how we've used Vireo in the past and what we are looking forward to when we use, when Vireo 4 goes live. So, you know, I'll start out by talking about um, UT Southwestern Medical Center. We are located in Dallas, Texas, and our ETDs, when we process them, they're processed in two specific defined paths. Um, this are the Southwestern Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences and the Southwestern Medical School. We don't have any lower divisions in any of our schools. We do, there are various programs within each, but one representative within each school receives, reviews, and approves all the ETD submissions from students in their schools. Um, when they approve them, they're moved to the library's workflow for the final review and publication, depending on the specific embargo period that's selected by each student. And in our case, in our institution, we have a default embargo set for two years from the degree, con the, the degree conferral date students have the option to waive that two-year embargo and you know release their so that their ETDs can be released immediately and typically we have about 40 to 60 ETDs each semester so it's so from a from a traffic point of view we were we were a good choice for a pilot because we have such a limited small pool of um, submissions. Um, the things we're looking forward to with Vireo 4, um, uh, you know, up, up till now with Vireo 3, the students in both schools used the same submission workflow, but with, because Vireo 4 allows the different, allows different workflows, we think that's really going to simplify the process for students because it allows them to immediately select their 
what school they're in and the appropriate degree and then just completely uh, and just completely go from there some fields like the school and the degree are they're automatically set and the and and we we've set them to be hidden because the student has already selected them in the work in, in the, when they start the workflow therefore they don't need to select them again and that when it's they're they're automatically saved and processed um, this the workflows allow the ability to define specific admin contacts to properly route all the system generated emails so there's no need there's no confusion about who's getting what um, my favorite thing about the Vireo 4 is the ability to define the controlled vocabulary terms either in general at the organization level or within specific workflows uh, at the top level, you know, we've set a single list of faculty names that the students see when they do their submission. Um, so, and that those names are set in the proper format when they're eventually published to the institutional repository. If a name is not included, uh, the student can still enter free text um, for their, their, their committee member who may not already be in the list. And then we can review, we as admins can review the list later and add them to the controlled vocabulary. At the school level, the, the one thing we've all, we would also like to do is set the list of majors, programs, um, have them, they're, they're separately defined so that the graduate school students don't have to see the medical school degrees, the majors, and the ma medical school won't have to see all the long list of graduate school programs. So I'll pass it over to Shelly Barba for next. Okay. Um, please let me know if you cannot hear me as I lost John there at the end. I can hear you. Um, I can hear you. You have to tell me in group chat. I'm just going to go with that. It's all well until I'm told differently. So at Texas Tech University, uh, a little bit about us. Uh, I, I think a part of the reason we were chosen, not only because Chris is at our institution, but that um, we have a very diverse university of different majors and different programs. We uh, have nine different colleges plus interdisciplinary studies and uh, uh, certifications that go through Vireo. So we uh, graduate or we process over over 700 ETDs a year uh, divided into three kind of chunks, spring, summer, and fall. And the big kind of issue for us is that in our graduate school, we only have two people who evaluate all the ETDs, one person for dissertations and one person for master's thesis. And so they are under an extreme time crunch to evaluate all of these things and go through it. And we're actually super excited about using Vireo for to customize the workflows to help their process go easier um, because we have such a variety of different programs in Vireo 3 right now it's it's very like top level but of course that um, gets a lot of people but it, it also makes a lot of headaches um, particularly um, in testing the graduate school is very excited to make a customized workflow for the music students because they're process is completely different than everyone else's and it's always a headache and it's always extra work that the graduate school has to do in order to make that go really well. Um, so the graduate school is really excited about that. In the library, uh, we also only have two people, myself and um, a staff person who works for me to publish and maintain the, um, the thesis and dissertation collection. We're excited to start to use, uh, utilize Vireo 4 with the different workflows 
get non-graduate school work. As Billy showed earlier of the um, using uh, the different workflows to get undergraduate work, which before we could not do, um, we're particularly interested in our honors college species. And we've also been contacted by our McNair Scholars Program who have a similar creating um, research and, and needing it going through a very similar kind of like review process by faculty people and being approved and then wanting to publish that. And we just not been able to facilitate that for them in three or four sounds like the perfect um, solution for that. So uh, those are the things that we were particularly excited about. Of course, I love controlled vocabularies. What librarian doesn't, right? <laughs> um, to make it better. And, uh, but we're still trying to think about like how we could All right. So I'm guessing, can you hear me? Yeah, and Shelly, luckily we got most of Shelly's presentation yeah. and so thank you, Shelly. You, <laughs> you did it. <laughs> All right, so uh, Taylor, Taylor Davis Van Atta is now going to share his, his, thought, his thoughts. Thank you, John. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Excellent. Um, I'm probably going to echo some of what's already been said uh, during the session and, and earlier in the day. Um, UH Libraries has used Vireo to manage the campus-wide processing of ETDs since the 2009-2010 academic year. Vireo is essential in helping us process over 600 uh, successfully defended theses and dissertations every year. We're a little bit, well, I think we are unique um, in that we don't have a thesis, a thesis of, office or any single sort of coordinating body for ETD activity. So we have established, um, and since 2017, I, as much as anybody, have overseen a decentralized distributed model for ETD processing that involves administrators in all 14 UH colleges, two staff in the graduate school, as well as myself and my staff in the libraries. This being the case, um, inefficiencies and inconsistencies um, in, in how our campus processes and how our colleges process uh, ETDs are largely felt in the libraries. Um, this is in part because everybody involved in this process looks to the libraries as the de facto thesis office, even though we're not in charge of university or graduate school policies. We can't control the, the sort of nuts and bolts tech behind Vireo and until now, uh, we haven't always been able to be responsive to college level or department level needs in terms of ETD workflows. This is also because um, while a lot of the administrative work of collecting and approving ETDs and associated metadata is effectively outsourced to the colleges, there remains a lot of metadata remediation and quality control that falls on library staff to take on. This amounts to item by item checks by staff level library personnel who could otherwise be contributing their expertise toward other projects taking place in our libraries. So Vario 4 is gonna help in this, in this regard in, in a few ways. Um, first, uh, we have set up differentiated workflows for different colleges. Uh, which allow for different processes or steps 
as well as different sets of metadata to be attached to ETDs uh, at the college level. This, at least in theory, will help settle some of the workflow and submission form questions that arrive um, in the grad school as well as in the libraries. Um, we'll be able to configure and reconfigure college workflows um, and submission forms to meet the specific needs of the colleges. Likewise, having the ability to import controlled vocabularies in the Vireo means that there will be less metadata remediation taking place in the libraries. Our staff will no, no longer need to correct uncontrolled metadata fields, such that our local in-house uh, digital asset management system um, uh, vocabulary schema will understand them, right? So now our in-house DAMS vocabulary will be the default in Vireo which alleviates the need for quality control of those fields uh, to take place in the libraries. Uh, in effect, that quality control will be taking place in the colleges. Taking a step back, um, ETDs make up about one fifth of our overall institutional repository activities. Um, if we measure that activity in terms of, of just items that, that get ingested to our IR, uh, each year. Uh, we've established uh, many partnerships with, with academic and administrative units across our campus um, that process a variety of other scholarly materials um, and prepare them for, for uh, upload to our IR. Um, in establishing workflows with these partnerships with our, with our campus partners, We've had to keep in mind the, the library's limited capacity for assuming sort of full administrative control over these materials. This has meant outsourcing much of the administrative process to our partners. Generally speaking, our partners will collect uh, the primary files, whether it's a, an honors thesis, a poster, or a set of files that, that compose a capstone uh, or some other um, sort of degree confirming project. Um, along with a pre-established set of, of metadata associated with those files. Um, many of these workflows closely approximate uh, those we have set up um, for processing graduate and professional degree ETDs through Vireo. Um, but we could be running these partnerships much more efficiently uh, by setting them up as a separate workflow um, for, say, the senior honors theses or, or capstone projects out of a, out of a certain department um, in Vireo 4. Um, and by folding these workflows into Vireo 4, um, again, we'll be alle alleviating some of the, the quality control and um, metadata remediation labor um, that takes place in the libraries. So I'll leave it there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Taylor. And I believe that's all for me. So I'm going to stop sharing now. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we did have a couple of questions that we have a little time for. Um, John, Stephanie, Larison asked um, if the grad school or medical school staff participated in the pilot. Um, curious about the non-administrative point of view of Vario 4. They, they participated slightly. They did, they, they, they were able to, I mean, I shared all the information. They were able to log in and view. They, they really do like the, the way it looks and how it, and how it is going to, they, they can see the benefit and how it is going to help them as they move forward. There was um, a comment from Rutger as well. Um, Rutger, do you want to, I know that you unmiked before, you might want to say this. Well, my comment was more that uh, we've already incorporated the way so that we can uh, make sure that people um, from another department, for example, can't see the input from uh, uh, departments they're not part of. Um, because you mentioned that you wanted to uh, filter out the, the amount of uh, stuff people can see, and that might be interesting as well. Okay. And that was it for the questions that I saw in the in the chat so far. Thank you so much, pilots. Very much appreciated. 
um, not only for participating and being patient as uh, um, Frank and the other developers worked through bugs and fixes and adjustments. Um, we know it, it's a lot to take on if you decide to pilot a big change in software. So thank you so much and thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, we have just one more section this morning um, before we take a 15 minute break. And so I'm just gonna go through a few things about our rollout um, of TDL upgrades and some new training materials. Um, I'm not sharing my, my screen um, full screen because I was having some internet connection difficulties. So this feels safe. I'm going to stick with this for right now. Um, so TDL's own upgrades and content migrations from Vireo to three to four, as Frank mentioned earlier, are taking place um, right now and they'll be going through September. It's going to happen in several steps, as he alluded to, and it's going to require um, several interactions between TDL and our member institutions as we go through the process. There'll be a period where, for instance, the Vireo 4 migration instance and the member's current Vireo 3 production instance will both be active, um, and that's an undetermined period of time right now. Basically, this is going to allow the user um, and their colleague time to customize and test drive Vireo 4 and make sure they're ready to switch over. And then when it's time to completely migrate to Vireo 4, then a final migration of all that interim activity that they did on Vireo 3 while they were still um, learning Vireo 4 can then be ported into the running Vireo 4 instance by the lead TDL developer, Frank. Um, TDL and the steering committee are also creating and have created training materials for TDL members and for the greater community. The steering committee actually updated the user documentation for 4.0, which can now be found on the Vireo user group wiki, which is replacing um, the Vireo users group website. So if you still use the website, note that we're in the process of moving all of the relevant content from that into the wiki and we're deprecating that site. So it will not be kept up to date. We have a big banner at the top that tells you that as well. So um, don't be surprised, we're moving it over. Um, I have included links to the documentation um, wiki here in this slide and it's also in the notes um, and Billy shared it as well earlier. So, um, and if you're in the agenda today, you're also in that Vireo user group wiki. TDL has also created some documentation to help our hosted users with starting up in the new Vireo 4 and with the process of the upgrade and migration as I briefly described and as Frank talked about earlier. So users is at large I think might also find this information helpful. Um, though I just want to specify that the getting started and migration frequently asked questions that I've listed here are directed specifically at TDL member users of Vireo. But again, I think it could be useful for others and we'll probably include um, another version of that that's more generic to the, the wider Vireo user community documentation. Um, finally, the fabulous Stephanie Larison, who you heard all about today, um, created an excellent YouTube video about what's new in Vireo 4. Um, so the content that, that Billy shared today, her, her, her adaptation came from that, that series. And so you can find that on the Texas Digital Library YouTube, and we've got it linked in our documentation as well. And I've got it linked here on the slides. Um, we also have, if you'll remember, some short training videos that are sort of more introductions to Vireo, kind of Vireo step-by-step -step training and how-to. And we're working on getting updated versions of those for Vireo 4 over the summer. And so you'll see announcements about that too coming soon. Um, other than that, for the TDL members, um, and I know that's a lot of you, but not everybody on the call today. Um, so we do have a TDL, um, a TDL hosted members only webinar training for Vireo 4 next month, the 17th of July. Um, we did share that invitation to the TDL Vireo service listserv as well as the TDL member listserv, but if you didn't see it, 
uh, and you are a TDL member interested in attending that training, please do reach out to support at tdl.org and let us know to make sure that not only that you're invited to that event, but also that you're subscribed to the appropriate list to get your news about Vireo. So with that, we have about five minutes for some Q&A before we take a break. Um, and I'm not seeing anything coming through the Zoom, but if you want to unmute yourself and ask something or make a comment about anything you've heard so far or anything at all, please do. Okay, I'm not seeing questions coming through. So I'm going to recommend, I'm still watching, but I don't see anything. So I'm going to recommend that um, for the break, you mute your mic and video. And um, since we're a little bit early here, um, let's say to be back, we will get started to talk about Vireo Futures at 12, 20, well, I'm sorry. No, at 1235. So we will start back at 1235. Go ahead and mute your video and your cameras and come back to us in 15 minutes. Thanks everybody.
howdy folks welcome back i hope you were able to have a nice break get some stretches breathe some air um we're entering into our final part of this be your users group meeting today um before we dive into Frank and Christopher and Chris talking about Virio Futures, um, I just want to remind you if you have a, if I had a magic wand thought about if you had a magic wand, what would you add to Virio? Um, what would it look like in the coming years? Please do add that to chat or to the community notes um, so that towards the end during our final discussion, um, we can share some of those ideas with y'all. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and hand back to Frank to share his screen. All yours, Frank. I'll let you know as soon as I see it. Yeah, thought I had it working. You're getting there. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Yep, there it is, and, and you sound great. Uh, but actually, I will hand it over to Christopher Starcher, and uh, he can start us off. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Um, I uh, have accumulated. Um, multiple hats in my during my time being involved with Vireo and um, I want to put on one of those uh, specifically and that is the hat of being product owner for this portion of the presentation. Um, I realize that the future of Vireo for most of you specifically in the short term has been discussed in the previous slides about Vireo 4. Migrating to Vireo 4 and learning to use the new interface and functionality is your most immediate focus. However, it is important for the Vireo user group steering committee to begin to look beyond the current state of Vireo and to begin planning for the future. The purpose of this section of the presentation is to inform you that we have already begun this task and to reveal our thoughts about the short-term and long-term goals for Vireo. There were, you can do the next slide, Frank. There you go. Sorry, that, that's... that's okay, that's all right. Um, there, were two, there were two primary reasons for the development of Vireo 4. The first was to improve and to add functionality to the system. As you've seen in previous slides, Vireo 4 has uh, many updates and many new features. The second reason was to upgrade uh, the code base. Vireo 3, as Frank mentioned earlier, relied on code that was at end of life and no longer being supported and maintained. If you go to the next one, Frank. Vireo's future resembles its past. The primary impetus for future versions of Vireo will also be to improve and add functionality and to upgrade the code base. Frank will now outline the major components we have currently identified for our short-term and long-term vision for Vireo. Please note that these are preliminary ideas that will change as we move forward. Once you have settled into Vireo 4 and feel comfortable with the functionality of the new system, we encourage each of you to participate in this conversation about the future of Vireo. Vireo is a community and we are all responsible for its progress. Each of you have the opportunity to shape Vireo's future. And now I'll turn it over to Frank. And uh, thank you, Chris. Um, yes, uh, these ideas, this is blue sky thinking for a lot of them. Uh, many of them may uh, really just affect developers and, you know, uh, deployment. Uh, some will affect users. Uh, we want to hear more for, from more ideas of improvements that will uh, uh, be noticeable by users. Uh, so this is, you know, we're looking at, you know, the next iteration of Virio 4 and, and beyond. 
Uh, so as you know, Chris mentioned, uh, there's you know ongoing bug fixes, uh, and there's also you know there's metrics that we've uh, we run. Uh, these there are tools that we run that uh, give us hints about our code quality, and uh, you know one of the things that a enhancement is just paying more attention to that and actually uh, taking to heed some of its ideas. I mean, it's an automated process, so you, you don't trust it blindly. But still, we, we need to pay more attention to that. Uh, and I mentioned uh, user interface updates. Uh, obviously, you know, user interface updates are gonna be uh, something that we want to do for the user. But also, we have some automated testing that we use. and. When you use automated testing, you will find uh, when you do a change to the software, you find out if you've broken something uh, that you may not otherwise notice because it's if you go through it manually, you will um, uh, y y it's very tedious and you may make mistakes uh, and it's hard to be comprehensive in your uh, testing. So we want to create a bigger test suite. We have a little bit of a test suite uh, using Selenium and Protractor. Uh, but if we do some UI updates, we can uh, we can make some changes that will allow Selenium and Protractor to be uh, more comprehensive and do better testing. So these are some of the things. Like I said, the, these may be more developer centric, but they have real implications for the users. Uh, the other thing is um, easier and varied deployment options. Uh, we have we've experimented with Ansible for our own deploys. Uh, I have built a Docker, uh, and I don't know if it's still in the GitHub, I believe it is. Uh, it may need to be updated. Uh, but to, to deploy using Docker, uh, this this will make deployment a lot easier for especially non-TDL institutions, but TDL as well. Uh, if we open up the uh, ease and uh, variety of deployments that we enable, uh, it, it's just gonna save us a lot of uh, uh, trouble ourselves and also possibly help desk time and it's just it's just a convenience factor so other things that are going to happen sooner uh, we of course want to get uh, much more community involvement we want other people to be able to contribute and we've seen a little expansion of that um, there, there's been a couple of people that uh, have, have uh, made some nice uh, bug fixes and they're getting started but some of the things to really guide that, it can be intimidating to jump into a big open source project and you uh, having instructions on how to contribute, knowing a little bit about uh, the process and, and policies, knowing something about uh, you know coding standards, uh, also providing a developer guide. Uh, these, these things uh, you know make it a lot easier to jump in and to know if your contribution is going to be helpful, if it's in the right, you know, in the of the right uh, plan, uh, knowing the vision, what we want to uh, do next. Uh, of course, you know, obviously there's bug fixes uh, that are specified in in uh, GitHub issues, but not everything is going to be software. People can contribute by updating documentation, uh, updating. Uh, you know, uh, readme files, uh, think there's a variety of things someone can do and testing, you know, just providing uh, testing feedback and creating those issues. Uh, let's see, identification of starter issues. You're new to the project, you want something simple uh, to, to really get uh, your feet wet with. Uh, having that list of starter issues for new developers is very helpful. When I came onto this project, uh, there, you know, Vario, uh, four was well underway, and it was helpful for me to have some starter issues to uh, to bring me on board. And of course, the steering committee, uh, you know, it does does the prioritization and uh, figures out uh, what these what of these issues will be of the next priority to be fixed. So, uh, you know, th there is there is guidance uh, after the fact too. So, but it's nice to have that input and all those ideas. So um, other things for uh, later uh, down the road, it, uh, Vario currently uses AngularJS. Uh, there's a more modern version of Angular and it's a watershed different, difference from AngularJS. And uh, it gives a lot more flexibility. Uh, it's 
you can provide good separation between the REST API and the user interface. Uh, so these are, these are some things that the user may or may not notice. Uh, the developers certainly will notice. Um, hopefully it will translate into a better experience for the, the user. Of course, that, that's the ultimate goal. Uh, other things is uh, there may be some uh, components that we can break off into separate services. This uh, leads to better testing. It leads to better, if you make a change, uh, you're less likely to interfere with something that's already ex existing. An example of that might be uh, just a, uh, a separate detached service that reads from the same database, but uh, can provide exports. Um, so uh, th these, these are just uh, the basic ideas to kick off the conversation. Uh, there are many more things that um, we uh, have not conceived of and uh, want to, and you know, uh, want to uh, get ideas. We want to get ideas from the, the greater community. And I'm going to stop the screen share and, uh, and open it up for a more conversation. Thank you so much, Frank and Chris. And I want to echo what what Chris said, especially that we're really excited for folks to dig into Vireo 4 partially because then we'll be able to hear more about what you want to see past Vireo 4 and what comes next. And I know that, you know, getting started with Vireo 4, that's a big hurdle for a lot of folks. But once you get in there, I really, we at TDL and I know the steering committee is excited to um, start over the next couple of years to really thinking about what we're doing next. Um, so are there any questions? I'll pause real quick here to see if there are any questions for Frank or Chris about anything that they just shared or any development specific questions. And again, you can feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to at this stage. And I just want to reemphasize that, you know, we're looking at it as a developer, or uh, I am uh, specifically. So, you know, we, we really need that uh, perspective of the users for what, uh, what they would uh, find useful in their own workflows. So Emily, I'll hand over to you. I know that we've had at least one addition and you might have some magic wand wishes as well. <laughs> so I'll let you lead this next part of the discussion. Okay, thanks, Courtney. Um, so <clears throat> the only thing that I see, and I saw a chat message pop up here a second ago, but the only thing I see is in the, the community notes and it says please name the uploaded file after the author's last name and not the submitter's last name. Um, this particular university has staff uploading theses for the departments not the student and so I guess they're asking for some more customization as to what um, what the the file would be named as. Is there anybody else that has? Okay we've got more. Um, user User-friendly or errors is one of the things that we would like. Rutger, can you um, talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Well, from the, from the back end, where mostly um, our administrative staff will be looking at what the students put in, um, you sometimes get a 500 error. And to them, that means, oh dear, I broke something. And that is something that we don't really like. It's more for programmers to see a 500 error uh, they should get some more um, to the point advice or maybe uh, contact your administrator or something like that. It's not even that useful for uh, programmers. Uh, I agree. That, that is an excellent point. We do need to, on the user interface, uh, present uh, something more meaningful. And some of these errors are not showstoppers for when someone's actually operating the things. And yes, they shouldn't always have an oh dear moment yeah. because there is the... In, some unknown error. I agree, absolutely. And, uh, another thing that. I noticed was that one, sometimes if you get an error, uh, for example, if something goes wrong with the deposit, uh, and you try to redeposit the same um, thesis, you get the same 500 error. 
without doing anything uh, wherever this thesis pops up. So even in the submission list to the end user, um, it shows this 500 error. Okay, yes. I'm not sure if this bug has already been fixed. I think my colleague has already uh, mentioned it, but. No, uh, but um, I, I agree that that uh, should be uh, something that, that should get fixed. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that there's so many things you you get used to them. Uh, well, we'll get to that later. Get to that later. But yes, that that is definitely a quality of use issue. I agree. It looks like Rutger, you have another one: importing and exporting a specific organization structure um, and deleting theses GDPR. Yeah, um, I, I would really like to once I've set up a system. I would like it to be able to, to export it and import it into a new uh, environment if needed. Um, it, it's also to, to keep uh, maybe things like uh, test servers and um, production servers uh, apart. Um, so to us, it would be really helpful to, to, have, to just have a simple um, export of all setups uh, so you can easily deploy a new uh, version of the server. Um, the other one is that we don't want to have um, another place where we store a lot of personal information like uh, email addresses, et cetera, from our students. Um, so it, the, the information in this system has to be removed after a certain amount of time. Um, actually, I think that uh, once something has been deposited and gets a, um, yeah, an, approved a reaction from, from the coupling, like the sword coupling, it should already be uh, removed after, let's say, two weeks or something. So are you saying automatically removed at following a, uh, an export? I, I think it would be best if you could uh, set it up that you uh, want to, to have it removed after, let's say, uh, an amount of days that you, you want to keep it there. Because Fireo is just for entering the um, thesis into the repository. It's, it should not be the place where the thesis stay as well. I, I agree. And, and sometimes historically some institutions have used it as a repository. But yes, it is indeed a, a tool for processing and then export. Uh, I just, I, we have to figure out a way that we're not going to prematurely delete something before we're certain that the process is, is done. But yes, that, that is, a, is a, does sound useful. Rutger, can I ask you a question? This is Courtney. Um, at your, forgive me for not knowing this, but at your institution, do you do you have developers who are interested in contributing to Vireo? And if so, it would be helpful to hear what else we could do as the lead developers to, to facilitate that better. Um, well, currently we have one developer working on it. Um, he also contributes um, Rama, he's called. Yes, he's been very helpful and, and uh, he has been very good at finding bugs. I've, I've done some ma minor things, but I will usually communicate it through Rama. So, that's... so, so yes, we, we do have developers and they already contribute. <laughs> yes, we, we definitely yeah. have seen Rama. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. We appreciate it. Any help, any help is welcome. Does anyone else have any wish list items they'd like to share? I think for me, one of the things that I would love, um, and I'm not, I don't think it's in Vireo 4 yet, but I'd love, um, I love the post-it notes to be able to give students additional information, but I'd like to be able to pin them at certain parts of the screen rather than all of them line up at the top. Um, and I had some trouble too with adding post-it notes. If I wanted to add a post-it note, um, I couldn't add it to a specific place. I had to copy and paste all of my text and, and rearrange it that way. Um, and so a little bit more ability to, to g move, maneuver those post-it notes, uh, both on the, back end, like on the back end so that it would help students would be um, really helpful, I think. It looks like someone is saying that they'd like the post-it note to support um, BR. I, 
I think that's just an HTML line break. Gotcha. Um, is it possible to either turn off the note function within submissions or to get an email alert when a student leaves a note? Um, it is currently easy for us to miss notes within a submission written by a student. I totally agree with that. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, sometimes what will happen is a student will leave a note in Vireo and we don't know that it's gotten there until maybe even days or weeks have gone by and so we can't address that note um, as, as quickly as we would have liked. I think we have that same issue. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Uh, Rutgers says works can be resubmitted without the repository knowing it. Um, I think there's a feedback missing in the Mets. Yeah, I, I can comment on that. Okay. Um, it's once you have um, published something, you can then submit it again. And because there's no, uh, we use the SWORD connection uh, because there's the, the um, repository handle that's connected to it isn't in the Mets of the second submission. You actually get duplicates. So that's something that I think might be missing from the MET still, from the specifications. I'm sorry, Matt, you, you'll get a duplicate in the METS file, in the METS.xml? No, we, we get a duplicate in the repository because it, the repository oh. doesn't know that it has already been submitted. Oh, uh, okay. So from the Schwartz connection, you get uh, a parameter back, um, which tells you um, what, what uh, item number it is in the repository. Oh, right, okay. This number isn't used in the METS code, which sends it to repository. So you can resubmit without uh, overwriting the previous submission. Okay, yeah. good point. Um, Billy is saying that it would be helpful that once a student has made the submission, if the student could go back in and edit their abstract. Uh, right now, only those on the administrative side can make these changes and students are often tweaking their abstracts. Um, Susan says, it would be great to have a way to be notified when the approver leaves any comments in the approval, um, like a request to change a embargo. So, um, Susan, are you saying it would be nice if they could, we could be notified if um, the student is making a change, they've made, an, they've made a note in the submission? Um, the thesis had already gone to the, the approver and the approver didn't, uh, they went ahead and approved the embargo and then they wrote a note saying they'd like the embargo to be changed. Mm -hmm. And when we didn't see it, because we didn't see the, the note, um, uh, they got mad at us. Yeah. And so a way that, you know, uh, if, you know, they leave a note in that approval uh, form that we would be notified to know, go check it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Um, Fred is asking, um, does Vireo 4 allow SWORD deposit default to DSpace for different doc workflows? For example, grad degrees automatically set to SWORD deposit to collection A and undergrad degrees set to deposit to collection B? I, I know that you can set two different or multiple deposit destinations, but I don't believe you can tie a particular default to a particular uh, workflow or, or degree set. I, I don't believe that's possible. I mean, it's possible, but it's not done. So that, that's a, a, a good suggestion. Does anybody have anything else to share? You can leave a comment or you can unmute yourself. I think there's still, still a book in the uh, deposit locations because if you have one deposit location it should automatically deposit there um, however what we've noticed is that it still asks you for the deposit location then so maybe it's uh, something that hasn't been uh, worked through to the final version of um, Vireo 
Um, what I also notice is that we can't remove deposit locations and we can't alter deposit, location, deposit locations. So for example, if you already have your deposit location, but you make a slight change in the collection that you would like to use within this deposit location, you can't do this. And I'm quite sure that you will probably already have this on the bug list and be resolving it, but uh, just to mention it. Thank you. If no one has anything else, I think, Courtney, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. I knew as soon as we had one, we would start a conversation. So <laughs> thanks so much for doing that, Emily. I appreciate it. Um, we've collected all of that feedback. Um, Frank, did you have any comments about any of the potential bugs or about how you'd like to hear about bugs? Because um, some of the some of these did come up where we weren't sure if they were a bug or not or something that was going to be fixed. Uh, there, there's no harm in uh uh, listing it uh, either uh, on the uh, uh, the listserv or uh, even uh, or on GitHub, and you know if it's if it's not a bug, uh, it, it's probably something that needs clarification in the documentation anyway. So um, I'm we're happy to hear about any of those. And we're not going anywhere after the meeting today. So if you think of something later. Um, reach out to us um, via the Vireo users group listserv, or if you're a TDL member, you're also welcome to reach us at support at tdl.org. Um, so now it's time if there are any final questions or discussion that y'all would like to have that you weren't able to, um, that something you didn't hear today that you wanted to hear. Um, now's the time because we're going to close down soon. Um, I really appreciate it that so many of you have stayed through today. It's been really great having such a large meeting. Again, we couldn't have done this at TCDL. Um, usually it's uh, about a third of the attendees that we saw at our highest attendance today. So it's been really good to be able to have so many folks nationally and internationally in addition to those folks in Texas who would be attending TCDL. So thank you. Um, we've got some people already bouncing to other meetings. Thank you, Taylor. Um, thanks again so much to the steering committee for helping put this together today, for helping us keep up with documentation and helping us shepherd through Vireo 4. Um, thanks to Frank, who over the last two years, his entire work life has been Vireo 4. <laughs> um, we do have, let's see, from Fred here, I'm seeing Frank. Um, uh, regarding his pre previous question, does he need to add this request setting different default stored deposit locations to a wish list, or is it enough to, to bring it up here? Um, just from me, Fred, and I'll let Frank answer too. We're keep we're capturing all of this in the notes from today, so everything that goes on the wish list, we'll make sure we're tracking, making sure it's compensated in issues or somewhere else. Um, Frank, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, no, I agree that you know it, it's more of it sounds to me more of a wish list item. Uh, if it turns out that, uh, you know, it, it's an issue, we'll, we can go ahead and create it from that. But um, yeah, we will have to triage things to wish list bugs or documentation issues. So, so yes, yeah. it, it is captured. Thank you. Yeah. And so every, and I'm sure as everyone knows too, um, Vireo 4 is our biggest priority, um, especially from TDL getting it, um, getting all of our users migrated up until September. So when we'll, we start prioritizing and looking at wish list items and new development is likely going to be more in the fall and winter. And you'll be hearing updates about that from the steering committee as well. And again, we'll also be working on those short intro videos, updating the videos for Vireo 4. So that'll be available to the user group in addition to the updated user documentation, which is already available. Um, Rutger is asking, how many Vireo 4 instances are live already? Uh, well, there's the the three pilots. There's the uh, the test dash etd. I have an experimental dash etd. So in, in regular use, uh, I I don't know what institutions beyond TDL are making regular use of it. But yeah, uh, nothing in production yeah. as far as I know either. Yeah, that that's that's what the summer is all about. Yep. 
I'll wait about another minute for uh, other questions. And remember, you can unmute yourselves as well if you'd like to ask a question or just say something. We'd love to hear you. Okay, I've been told that waiting 90 seconds is the official amount of time in Zoom <laughs> to give people who are hesitant to contribute. So I think we're good. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close our session for today. Again, this was recorded and we will be providing this recording. Um, and I just want to thank everyone again for coming and staying. We'll provide the notes as well. Those shared notes are going to stay available. And you'll be hearing from us more over the course of the summer as we continue adding training materials and talking about what the Vireo future is going to look like. So take care, everybody. Thank you, steering committee. Thank you, presenters. Bye, everybody. Thank you.